Mike, uh, you've created a new film uh, utilizing new technology. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little about that? Um, it's a it's a feature film, uh, but it's shot on um, DV cam, uh, four of them, in fact, at the same time. And the film, I, I suppose, technically what's unusual about it is there is, there's no editing in the film, so it's a complete, you know, uh, uninterrupted take um, times four. And the screen is then split up into four, a quadrant. And um, uh, the story, of all four screens deal with the same story, but, you know, from different points of view, not only physically, but also in terms of the characters. Um, the film was improvised, so it was a, you know, what, what they screened the film today, what, what people saw was, in fact, literally what was shot in one afternoon in a 93-minute take in Los Angeles on four cameras. It's called time code because we used, obviously, time code to synchronize the playback of all four screens. And at some point, the film itself converges into a single story or a storyline that... that it's, um, it sort of implodes in the sense that uh, initially what, what you see looks like chaos. You have no idea how these four cameras relate to each other, but very, very quickly. In fact, what happens is an earthquake, about, I think about 15 minutes into the film, and the earthquake occurs simultaneously on all four screens, and you realize that you're looking at something in real time. And then the ref each, each actor, for example, they all improvised, but they all had a mobile phone. So the actors are constantly ringing each other from one screen to another. So your eye quickly informs you that oh, we're watching the same story. And in a way, I compare it to like a French farce. It's like a fado farce where people are constantly occupying different parts of you know the, the stage, as it would be. And always doing asides. To yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 I understand that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a nice idea. And you can use things like, for example, the mobile phones give you a lot of plot information. Um, not only literally what they say, but when they're lying, you can see immediately that they're lying because the camera reveals the classic one of, you know, the man phoning his wife and saying, darling, I'll be home later, I'm working at the office. But if on camera you see that he's actually not at the office, he's with his mistress. You know, you can, ins if you like, enjoy the farce humor of it. Now, when you made this film, you did it all on on digital. Did you also do all the post production on digital, and have you then rendered it to film to mm -hmm. uh, put it out? Well, the post production, of course, is very limited because there's no editing. That's the, one of the joys of my life with this film is that I didn't have to go into an editing room, other than to color correct all four screens. Um, the most complex thing in post was, in fact, the sound edit, which was done in a fairly conventional way. In fact, that was the slowest part of the process. And in f uh, when I did the DVD release, we, we're releasing two versions of the film on DVD. And the second version I just mixed using um, Pro Tools, um, treating as if, in fact, it was a piece of music and found that to be much quicker and much more efficient. So um, there have been a lot of revelations in the process of making the film about how one can speed up the creative process, in fact, retain the creative process, whereas in fact most filmmaking, you know, you have to hang on to a memory of a creative idea. By the time you actually get to do it, it's, it really is like watching paint dry. Yeah, and you render it through so many layers sure. that it eventually becomes uh, sort of a, it's an afterthought. It is, yeah. yeah. And the, you know, the best you can hope for normally, I've found, in filmmaking is that maybe in five or six years' time <clears throat> you unexpectedly see the film on cable at four o'clock in the morning and, and are pleasantly surprised by some elements of it. But it takes that long to forget the process. You know? So you don't have that wonderful thing that you have in theatre and music, which is the instant spontaneity of the moment. And uh, with the new digital technology, you, you clearly do have that. You can turn on a dime. And it's not expensive, that's the other thing. I mean, you know, you're not, you're not, I mean, I've just shot a video, for example, a very nice singer, David Gray, I shot it in San Francisco. Um, and I shot it on 16 and on DVD. And I found constantly, every time I shot on 16, one of the producers came and say, well, how, how are we doing on film stock? Because I know, because budget-wise and so on. Whereas, you know, 10 tapes in on DVD, no one's blinked an eyelid, you know. Now, there's a, in America, there is kind of a movement to, to producing feature films, or at least uh, kind of underground feature films mm -hmm. on digital video. Do you see this becoming part of the industry standard uh, at some point? Well, the industry standard, uh, it's quite interesting. You know, um, say 15 years ago, 
uh, the phrase industry standard would almost induce fear in a filmmaker because, you know, there was the feeling that rather God, it could turn around and say not good enough, you know, and, and you could be punished or banished from somehow releasing your film. Certainly when it came to television, you know, there were always the people, uh, you know, the controllers who would say it's not good enough quality to go out in the air. And I don't know what that means. I mean, for example, if anybody shoots a sort of crummy video of a natural disaster, it gets screened a million times on some awful show about, you know, the world's worst disasters. Nobody seems to worry about quality then. Um, and what I like now is that that beast has sort of been put back into its cage by the sheer weight of enthusiasm and of material that's been generated now. So it's almost like the cart is no longer pulling the horse. I believe the horse is now where it belongs, back at the front of the, of the group. Well, during this last year, a couple of um, real popular films, I think of Vim Vendor's Buena mm -hmm. Vista Social Club, was sure. also shot on... Uh, a combination. A, a combination, yeah. but mostly on... Well, actually, on, high, uh, on the high def, I think, the digi... Did you beta yeah. and on DV. Um, actually, in the film, I, I preferred the stuff, the DV stuff myself. It had a sort of richness to it and a kind of originality. And I, whether it was the lighting or something, but the concert footage I found a little bit video-ish, actually, funnily enough. Um, but anyway, I interrupted. I'm sorry. No, but so do you see a lot of directors experimenting in this medium now? I mean, just saying, hey, we're going to go out and see what we can do in that area? I think film is so beset by fashion and by um, peer pressure. I think in the short term, yes, I mean, all kinds of producers will flirt with the idea. Studios like Sony have flirted with the idea. Um, but it's a flirt. I mean, they are definitely married to the big lady, known as, you know, 35 mil, um, because, f from a capitalistic point of view, they have such a heavy investment in the hardware. And they're not about to junk it all, which is what it really boils down to. I mean, just look at the distribution system. I mean, the technology exists to project very fine, high-quality images. Now, I've seen the tests. I've seen them. They're great. We've, we have got that man on the moon. <clears throat> the question is, do we want to bring anybody else there? And I think the answer at the moment is no, <clears throat> because, uh, you know, I think the distributors would just rebel right now. And I think the same if you go through all the post-production houses. Now, there is such a such a weighted interest in retaining the old that this flirting will take place and I but I think more seriously uh, completely independently of that industry a counter industry will has emerged and will just blossom which is younger filmmakers who um, inf are not encumbered by that investment people setting up their own little production companies will just buy you know what is relatively very cheap equipment I mean, I did my sums the other day, and I to students and said, well, I think for under £10,000 investment <clears throat> in software and hardware, you could make a feature film. You could own all of the equipment that you would need to make a perfectly watchable and, and very good quality film. That's pretty staggering, really. What... We, we did an interview this morning with the vice president of Disney Films, and mm. uh, they've made a substantial commitment to um, also DV, and they've set up, as you were talking about, uh, distribution is a problem, mm -hmm. you know, either rendering it to film and then showing it in the traditional manner, mm -hmm. or in their case, they've now set up 35 um, film projectors. But my understanding is, is that a DV projector is much more expensive than a film projector and will make it difficult to put it on the commercial circuit. If I, without being too right, I think that's complete and utter crap. You know, <clears throat> you know, and we know looking at, you know, just the prices and availability of cameras and the quality, that just in the space of a couple of years how the quality has rocketed up, the price has rocketed down. Um, the problem is not the cost of a digital projector, it's the cost of what you would have to throw away i.e. your 35 mil projector. I mean, in some of the, for example, the West End of London, some of the really big s screenings, you know, cinemas, you're, you're talking about equipment that's been there since the 50s, which works because, you know, it is what it is. I mean, you can upgrade parts of it and increase the luminous output and, you know, the, the, the sound systems that will give you wonderful kind of, you know, uh, sound reproduction. The basic mechanical beast hasn't changed. 
And there is this huge resistance to this. I mean, my understanding is, and I've done bits of research, is that really for a smaller screening room, you know, £40,000 will get you a pretty good projector. I've seen some appalling 35 mil projectors, and I've seen some appalling prints. The problem is, you know, if you, if you take a first-generation print on its opening day, <clears throat> the quality is superb. By the time it's been through the gate a hundred times, it's not superb. It's actually quite appalling. It's scratched. The buildup of dust on the real changes is appalling. The illusion of watching magic is pretty much diminished. The p whole point about a digital projection is that it's always the same. It doesn't diminish. It doesn't wear out in that sense. Therefore, you know, I go back to my original statement. It, there is a resistance. It's not an economic problem. You look at a blockbuster. If it fills its, its cinema for a couple of weeks, it's basically made the price of the projector back. We're talking about companies that have colossal profit, you know. Mike, thank you very much for being with us today. Pleasure. <laughs>